In this video, I'll talk about network vulnerabilities. The goal with network security is to allow only legitimate access to the network. Most attacks tend to occur from inside the network, so we don't often have malicious users trying to hack in directly from the outside. Instead, malicious users can get network access and wreak havoc in a number of ways, including an infected USB thumb drive that a user brings into the network, or users opening file attachments or clicking links that trigger malware. Even drive-by website infections can occur where a user is simply viewing a website without even clicking anything. So we need to consider all network entry points just like we would consider entry and exit points for physical building security. This includes network switches and their wall jacks that devices plug into. So we should always disable unused switch ports and for those that will be active we should configure MAC filtering so only certain MAC addresses are allowed to be plugged into certain switch ports. Now of course MAC addresses can be spoofed but this is yet another layer in our security defense. VPN appliances should always be configured to use multi-factor authentication or MFA. This is considered much more secure and more difficult to crack than standard username and password authentication. Wireless access points should be configured to use centralized radius authentication as opposed to a pre-shared key configured on the device directly. IEEE 802.1x plays an important role with network security. This is a security standard that hardware and software can be compliant with. So it applies to wired and wireless network access. The idea is that users and devices need to be properly authenticated before being allowed on the network. So this means even before DHCP would give an IP configuration to a device, it would have to successfully authenticate first. Now you might wonder how that's possible. How could it forward an authentication request to a central server elsewhere if it doesn't even have an IP? It doesn't do it. It's the connecting device like the network switch or the wireless router that does it. So therefore, the actual connecting device doesn't actually need to have a valid IP configuration for this to work. IEEE 802.1x devices include things like network switches, routers, VPN appliances, and wireless access points. There's also the physical network access side of things that we want to make sure that we don't forget about. So as we've mentioned, we should be disabling unused wall jacks, which in the end connect to switch ports. We should control access to wall jacks, even beyond MAC address filtering. So therefore, wall jacks should only be available within a secured building or a floor with restricted access or even behind locked doors in certain parts of the building. That in conjunction with disabling unused switch ports and MAC filtering adds to our layered security defenses. Also, wiring closets must always be behind locked doors to prevent things like wiretapping or rerouting network connections by plugging things into different locations or even plugging in devices like rogue wireless access points. On the Wi-Fi side of things, there are a number of things we can do to harden or secure that environment. The first is user awareness regarding things like rogue access points. A rogue access point is simply a Wi-Fi access point that isn't authorized to be on the network. So a malicious user could have a rogue wireless access point that looks legitimate that users connect to. So now the malicious user is seeing all of the user traffic. We should always apply firmware patches to our Wi-Fi routers. We should also consider disabling remote internet administration. We should use HTTPS administration. We should consider disabling the broadcast of the wireless network name or the SSID. And even though MAC addresses can be spoofed, we should still enable MAC address filtering. Our wireless routers, of course, should never do their own authentication. Instead, they should forward it to a centralized radius server. And we might even consider the use of a shielded location for Wi-Fi to prevent the radio signals from emanating beyond a specific area. Rogue network services, as we've mentioned, include things like Wi-Fi access points and DHCP servers that can cause problems on the network. A rogue DHCP server, for instance, could even be considered a denial of service attack if a malicious user gets it on the network because it might give out bogus IP information to devices so that they can't connect to anything legitimate. Then there are misconfigurations for things like network access control lists or ACLs. These are often called packet filtering rules. Essentially, we want to make sure that they are set to deny all traffic by default. 
And so then you should make allowances only for what is required beyond this default configuration. ARP cache poisoning is another danger if a malicious user gets on the network in that they could essentially spoof the default gateway or router as being themselves so that all traffic would be forwarded through the malicious user device. Denial of service attacks, as we've mentioned, come in many forms, and it could include network broadcast storms or, as we've mentioned, a rogue DHCP server. A distributed denial of service attack is a little bit different in that there are multiple computers involved in the attack, such as flooding a victim host or network with useless traffic. So therefore, we should be using network intrusion and detection and prevention systems to detect anomalies, log and notify, and ideally with the prevention system, stop the activity from continuing if it's suspicious. We should encrypt all transmissions, including internally on our local area networks. Now, to do that, you're probably not going to go through configuring PKI certificates for every app. It's too much work. Instead, you might use something like IPsec, which can apply to all traffic, regardless of higher level protocol. We should always harden all devices on the network, including things like user smartphones, because a single compromised smartphone could compromise the entire network. We should have periodic network penetration testing because we can learn a lot from this about weaknesses we might not realize were there and that were exploitable. Ideally, this can be done by a third party. However, we could also have internal penetration tests conducted by our own IT teams. Periodic network vulnerability assessments should also be conducted, again, either internally or third party. The difference between it and a pen test is that the pen test actually exploits weaknesses it finds. The vulnerability assessment does not. It just reports on it. And the biggest single most important factor here is user awareness and training of things like social engineering or trickery. All of the hardening that we've discussed is pretty much useless if users irresponsibly open file attachments in messages that look suspicious or that they weren't expecting or click links on all kinds of websites they shouldn't be visiting. 